Welcome back, and I just want to say, I got a little treat for you guys today. Did you guys know that there was once wild camels in the United States? Now, I'm not talking about the camels, the, like, how they originated here, the llamas and alpacas in South America. Like, no, I'm talking about, like, actual, like, dromedary and back turned camels wild in the American West. Also, you're going to hear about a crazy, kind of a ghost story that I'd like to get into in this video as well, so... Hope you guys stay tuned, and please, if you like this video, leave a like, leave a comment with another fact that I can look up that we can go over on this series, and subscribe button and ring that bell so you can know any time that I upload. So without further ado guys, here's the story of the camels in the American West. Real quick, and I'm going to have to cut this out, I do not have owned this thing, I did not write this article, this all belongs to SmithsonianMagazine.com, and I, if you guys actually want to read more into this, I would suggest going to their website and reading, reading it, because like I said, I don't own it. This is purely for reading and viewing pleasure, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Enjoy this. Whatever happened to the wild camels of the American West? Initially seen as the army's answer to how to settle the frontier, the camels eventually became a literal beast of burden with no home on the range. In the 1800s, a wild menace haunted the Arizona Territory. It was known as the Red Ghost, and its legend grew as it roamed the high country. It trampled a woman to death in 1883. It was rumored to stand 30 feet tall. A cowboy once tried to rope the ghost, but it turned and charged his mount, nearly killing them both. One man chased it, then claimed it disappeared right before his eyes. Another swore it devoured a grizzly bear. There's no way that's true, but it's fun. The eyewitness said it was a devilish looking creature strapped on the back of some strange looking beast. Marshall Trimble, Arizona's official state historian tells me, after the first attacks, a group of miners, miners spotted the ghost along the Verde River. It's Trimble, as Trimble explained, an Arizonian, his book about folk tales of the Old West, they took aim at the creature when it fled the gunfire, something shook loose and landed on the ground. The miners approached the spot where it fell. They saw a human skull laying in the dirt. Bits of skin and hair stuck to the bone. Several years later, a rancher near Eagle Creek spotted a feral, red-haired camel grazing in his tomato patch. The man grabbed his rifle, then shot and killed the animal. The ghost reign of terror was over. News spread back to the East Coast, where the New York Sun published a colorful report about the red ghost's demise. When the rancher went out to examine the dead beast, he found strips of rawhide wound and twisted all over his back, his shoulders, and even under his tail. Something or someone was once lashed onto the camel. The legend of the Red Ghost is rich with embellishments, the macabre furnish flourishes, and imaginative twists needed for any great campfire story. Look close, though, past the legend, past the skull and the rawhide and the eyewitness accounts, and you'll discover a bizarre chapter of the American frontier history. In the late 19th century, wild camels really did roam the West. How they got there and where they came from is a story nearly as strong as fiction. So, just we gotta unpack this for a second. Someone, if that story is true, that means somebody hated a person so bad that they caught a wild camel, which is no easy feat, strapped the poor guy to its back. So the poor camel and this poor person and literally the guy died of, I can only assume, his thirst or starvation. And then rotted off the back of the camel. That, I, that is a whole other level of hate. All I can say about All I can say about that. Um, yeah. So I had to take that little tangent real quick because that is just an incredible part of the story. And it's crazy that a camel is actually the... Red Ghost is what it ended up being. So without further ado, let's just find out how these camels actually got into the American West and what the plan was there. Davis believed that camels were key to the country's expansion westward, a transcontinental railroad was decades away from being built, and he thought the animals could be well suited to haul supplies between remote military outposts. By 1857, after a pair of successful trips to the Mediterranean and the Middle East, the U.S. Army had purchased and imported 75 camels within a decade, though each and every one would be sold at auction. The, cam 
The camels were stationed in Camp Verde in central Texas, where the army used them as beasts of burden on short supply trips to San Antonio. In June 1857, under orders from Washington, the herd was split. More than two dozen were sent on an expedition to California, led by Edward Fitzgerald Bale. Five months later, Bale's party arrived at Fort Tijon, an army outpost a few miles north of Los Angeles. A California Historical Society quarterly paper written by A.A. A. Gray, 1930, noted the significance of that journey. Bell had driven his camels more than 1,200 miles in the heat of summer through a barren country where feed and water were scarce, and over high mountains where roads had to be made in the most dangerous places he had accomplished what most of his closest associates said could not be done. Oh, that makes sense. Camels are, you know, that wouldn't be rough for them. Back east, the army put the remaining herd to work at Camp Verde at the several, at several, and at several outposts in the Texas region. Small pack trains were deployed to El Paso and Fort Bowie. According to a 1929 account by W.S. Lewis, in 1860, two expeditions were dispatched to search for undiscovered routes along the Mexican border. By that time, though Congress had also ignored three proposals to buy additional camels, the political cost seemed to be too high. The mule lobby did not want the importation of more camels for obvious reasons, Trimble said. They lobbied hard in Washington against the camel experiment. Basically, I think they saw the writing on the wall with that one because camels would do better than mules, honestly. I, I think so. They're harder to take care of and more frustrating and definitely more wild. Um, now, granted, I don't have that much experience with mules. But mules, I mean, there's a phrase, stubborn as a mule, for a reason. Um, so, yeah, but I could see why they would lobby hard against it, because that would, if camels came to the U.S., that would have essentially put them out of business. Like, it wouldn't have even been a question. They, they probably would not have done as well, or at least wouldn't have done as well during that time, and that was a big time for them, I would assume. If the mule lobby didn't kill off the experiment, the Civil War did. At the dawn of the war, after Texas second, after Texas succeeded from the Union, Confederate forces seized Camp Verde and its camels. They were turned loose to graze, and some wandered away. Popular Science reported in 1909. That's how old Popular Science is, by the way. 1909. Think about that. Three of them were caught in Arkansas by Union forces, and in 1863 they were sold to Iowa at auction. Others found their way into Mexico. A few were used by the Confederate Post Office Department. One camel was reportedly pushed off a cliff by Confederate soldiers. That's messed up. Another, nicknamed Old Douglas, became the property of the 43rd Mississippi Infantry, was reportedly shot and killed during the siege of Vicksburg, then buried nearby. Man, these camels were dropping like flies, it feels like. I gotta go up some. By late 1863, in the midst of the Civil War, the camel experiment was essentially finished. The California camels moved from Fort Tijon to Los Angeles, had foundered without work for more than a year. In September, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton ordered the animals to be put up for auction. An entrepreneur of the frontier named Samuel Mc... McCullen? McLaughlin? I'm not sure bought the entire herd in February of 1864, then shipped several camels out to Nirvana to haul salt and mining supplies in Virginia City. McCollin raised money for more for the trip by organizing a camel race in Sacramento. A crowd of a thousand people reportedly turned up to watch the spectacle. According to Gray's account, the animals that remained in California were sold to zoos, circuses, even to and even back to Bale himself. For years, one might have seen Bale working camels about his ranch and making pleasure trips with them, accompanied by his family. The Texas herd was auctioned off shortly thereafter in 1866 to a lawyer named Ethel Coopwood. For three years, Coopwood used the camels to ship supplies between Laredo, Texas, and Mexico City, and that's when the trail starts to go cold. So we're finally losing like historical data on the camels now. Yeah. Coopwood and McLaughlin sold their herds in small bunches to traveling zoos, to frontier businessmen, and on and on. I spoke with Doug Baum, a former zookeeper and owner of Texas Camel Corps, to learn where they went from there 
As it turns out, the answers aren't so clear. When the Army brought its camels to Texas, private businesses imported hundreds more through Mobile, Gal Mobile Galveston, and San Francisco, anticipating a robust market out west. Eh, guess that never happened? Um, so, jump the gun on that one, I guess. Those commercially imported camels started to mix with the former Army camels in the 1870s, says Baum. The mixed herds made it increasingly difficult to track the offspring of the army camels. Unfortunately, it is really murky where they ended up and what their ultimate dispositions were because of those nebulous traveling menageries and circuses, he says. So basically, once more camels came in, they just lost track of which ones belonged to the army originally. Um, that's not to say the fate of every army camel is unknown. We know what happened to at least one, a white-haired camel named Sad. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> he was Bale's prize riding camel during the expeditions west, and at the Fort Tihon, he was killed by a younger, larger camel in his herd. A soldier who also served as a veterinarian arranged to ship Sad's body across the country to Washington, where it could be preserved by the Smithsonian Institute. The bones of that camel are still in the collections of the National Museum of Natural History. National, sorry, the National Museum of Natural History. And as for the rest, many were put to use in Nevada mining towns. The unluckiest were sold to butchers and meat markets, and some were driven to Arizona to aid with the construction of a transcontinental railroad. When that railroad opened, though, it quickly sunk any remaining prospects of camel-based freight in the Southwest. Owners who didn't sell their herds to traveling entertainers or zoos reportedly turned them loose on the desert, which finally brings us back to the story of the Red Ghost. So, now we're getting into how there's actually wild ones in the West. Feral camels did not survive in the desert, although there almost certainly weren't enough living in the wild to support a thriving population, sightings, while uncommon, were reported throughout the region up until the earliest 20th century. It was rare, but because it was rare, it was notable, Baum says. It would make the news a young Douglas MacArthur, living in New Mexico in 1885, heard about a wild camel wandering near Fort Celadon. A pair of camels were spotted south of the border in 1887. Baum estimates there were 6 to 10 actual sightings in the postbellum period up to 1890 or so. The legend of the Red Ghost, a crazed wild monster roaming the Arizona desert, fits snugly within the shadow of the camel experiment. Do you think it happened? So I think this is the Red Ghost part of it. Yes, Baum says, and it very likely could have been one of the army camels since it was an Arabian camel. In other words, the fundamental details behind the legend might contain some truth. A wild camel, possibly an army camel that escaped from Camp Verde, was spotted in Arizona during the mid-1800s. A rancher did kill the camel after spying in his garden, and when that rancher examined the animal's body, he found deep scars dug across its back and body. Fact or fiction, the story of the Red Ghost still leads back to the inevitable, the unanswerable. Could a person really have been lashed onto a log camel? Who was he, and if he did exist, why did he suffer such a cruel fate, says Trimble? There's just all kinds of possibilities. Yeah? I mean, I'd, you would have to really hate somebody. I think that's it. Yep. That's it for that. Okay, guys. Well, that was uh, pretty much it. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this little story. I hope you enjoyed it, learned about the history. Um, like I said, there's probably are actually wild camels in the U.S. There's just not a large enough group of them to really call it an established population. Um, but there could have been. This, If you know the railroad had went south, we could have had just droves of camels going across the prairies instead of uh, mule wagons and you know the trains. Um, I do think it's really cool that one of them managed to actually uh, not only give you like one of the greater ghost stories that came out of the West in Arizona, but also one of the most gruesome deaths I could ever imagine somebody having to go through. Uh, so yeah, anyway guys, if you like this video, please leave a comment with anything you guys would like to see me cover. Um, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, all that good stuff. Follow me on Instagram, um, it'll be right after this, and I will see you in the next video. Peace.